Now, I suppose you're wondering what the layout of the second floor was like. It went something a little bit like this. There were 35 guest rooms. Now, some of them were ordinary seeming enough, set up like just your regular old hotel guest room, bed, bathroom, etc. However, more than half of them were soundproof, lined with asbestos, had iron walls, contained trap doors that led to smaller chambers below. Also, some of them had walls that were fitted with gas jets that could pump deadly gases into them at any given point in time. And some of them had blowtorch-like devices that could be turned on and incinerate a victim. Now, Holmes's personal apartment was also on this level, in which he had a vault that he used to put victims into. He had a secret room underneath his bathroom that he could also hold someone in. And he had a unique alarm system that alerted him if any of his captors were trying to escape. The hallways on this floor were a myriad, a complete maze of hidden passageways, secret doors, hidden stairwells, um, false doors, doors to nowhere. Um, there was actually a staircase that dropped down out into the middle of the street and when you got to the bottom of the door. But the most useful aspect of this entire floor was the grease-lined chutes that led from captors' rooms, some from the hallway, and also from Holmes' personal apartment down to the basement. Now, if the description of the second floor wasn't enough for you, I'm going to let you know what police found when they went into the basement. The grease line chutes, remember, took victims from the second floor down into the basement, where they found there a myriad of poisons and torture devices, even a stretching rack. Uh, there was a dissection table with numerous surgical tools on which it's noted that Holmes would meticulously dissect his victims, sometimes while they were still alive, and um, piece the skeletons back to together after they'd been stripped of flesh to sell to local doctors and medical schools as models. There were also quicklime pits and a pit of corrosive acid, uh, corrosive acid, excuse me, under the floors where Holmes could quickly and easily dump a body and it would be gone within a few hours. There were also two furnaces in the basement used as crematoriums to get rid of the evidence, a wooden box filled with women's skeletons, and police found a ball of women's hair hidden underneath the staircase, carefully wrapped in soft cloth, I guess as a trophy. It's hard to believe that all of this happened back in the 1890s as opposed to something more modern or in a Hollywood film. But needless to say, Holmes was at least very creative and dedicated to his cause. He didn't only kill people in the murder castle. Holmes also committed the murders of various children from his different mistresses and consorts, somewhere around four in total, and also a longtime associate who helped him with many of his fraud scams and friend uh, who Holmes burned to death to collect insurance money from. So, how was all of this discovered? All in all, how did Holmes get caught? Well, strangely enough, during the time that these murders were taking place at the murder castle, Holmes managed to keep everything under wraps. Now, shortly after the World's Fair, he decided to leave Chicago because the economy was in a slump. From there, he traveled to Texas, where he tried to pull a horse swindle scam, trying to steal horses and have them transferred to St. Louis. He got caught and thrown in jail for a very brief time period. However, when he was in jail, he met a train robber by the name of Marion Hedgepeth. Now, talking with Marion, Holmes asked him for the name of an attorney that could possibly help him in faking his own death in exchange for giving Hedgepeth a dividend from the insurance money. Now, all in all, after he got out of jail, Holmes was not able to fake his own death. That's where the murder of his associate comes in, and he subsequently collected the money. Well, Marion Hedgebeth felt kind of swindled and left out, so he tipped off the police to Holmes' insurance scams. Now, detectives were following Holmes' travels throughout the country and traced him back to Chicago, where they interviewed the janitor. When the janitor told him, told these detectives, that he was never allowed to clean the second floor, that's when they started looking into things and found the murder castle itself. 
With all the evidence collected and in place, Holmes was arrested and put on trial for six days. Now, during this time, he admitted to 27 murders. However, it's generally believed, and he indicated himself, that the number was far greater than that. Some people think it's upwards of 230. However, Holmes was sentenced to death, and on May 7th of 1896, he was hanged. It took him 20 minutes to die because his neck didn't snap right away. And rumor has it that a streak of lightning flashed across the sky the second that Holmes was let down from the gallows. In August of that same year, 1896, the murder castle burned to the ground sometime after midnight under mysterious circumstances. Now, the lot was left vacant because of its history for many years and wasn't built upon again until 1938, when a United States post office was put there, which, strangely enough, had been the profession of H.H. H. Holmes' father. Now, up to this day, it's still said that that general area is haunted and that you can hear the cries of those that have been murdered coming from underneath the ground. What does the study of eugenics and the clinic Planned Parenthood have in common? Join us in a future video when we're going to delve into the history behind Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. So, I will certainly think twice the next time I'm looking on Craigslist for a gig or anything like that. Uh, makes me want to be a little bit more wary. Thanks for joining me on our discussion of H.H. H. Holmes and the Murder Castle. Please rate my video, leave me any comments that you have, and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time.